What's going on everybody? Taylor White here from CK Supply and today we're going to talk about MIGWELL. But more specifically, how do we make a good well? And what is a good well? I guess you could say one that doesn't break. And while yeah, I would agree with you there, I would also say it's a bit more complicated. When it comes to making a good weld, it's almost like someone baking a fresh dessert. Now we've all had a cookie from the grocery store, not too bad, it's sweet, maybe not the greatest thing in the world, but hey, it's a cookie. Then we go to a real baker, and that cookie is amazing. It's fresh, it's done exactly right, and that's what welding is like. Yeah, you may have a weld here that looks pretty good, but this other weld I'm looking at, it's done perfectly. Everything was selected exactly right, time, temp, and ingredients all tailored to have the best desired output. And that's what I'm gonna cover with you today. How can we make the best weld with MIG welding? In this process, we have many variables to consider. Our wire size, the setting on the machine, the transfer mode we set up for, and even the gas we choose affects the quality of our weld. And on top of that, we have to make sure our technique is perfect while looking through what is comparably 10 different shades of sunglasses. It can be a rather difficult task if you don't know what changing these variables actually does. Like what's going to happen if I change wire sizes in the middle of a project? Or say, maybe you're not used to welding on thicker material and now you're unsure what to change to make sure it's a strong weld. So let's break down the thought processes and changes we can make to get the best results. Number one, what the heck are we welding? This is always going to be your first question. What is it? Different materials are going to be using different filler metals and gases. So it is critical we know what our base material is. Number two, how thick is the material? This will determine what your settings are gonna be, what transfer mode you should use, and might have a decision towards gas selection. Number three, what position are you going to be welding in? This has a lot to do with what you can get away with as far as transfer mode and your technique. Once we know these three key factors, we can start making decisions on our setup. Starting with our wire diameter. This is the direct path the current will take to enter our weld. And as you can imagine, the larger the diameter, the more current we can move through it over a given period of time. So, in reference to this, we can assume that when we are welding thin materials like sheet metal, we should use a thin gauge wire, like 023 or 030. If we need a general purpose wire, 035 is a great choice. And for our thicker metals over a quarter inch, we can go to an 045 or larger. Keeping in mind that our settings will change with each wire diameter. Something like 035 will need 350 inches per minute wire feed speed to achieve 180 welding amps, while 045 will only need 180 inches per minute to achieve 180 welding amps. Remember, wire feed speed influences your penetration significantly more than voltage because wire feed speed controls amperage. Amperage influences penetration. Voltage creates arc length and creates pressure on the face of the weld. If you haven't noticed by now, in front of me, I have a few samples. These are welds we did in the lab, keeping in mind most of them were done with 035 solid wire. And then we cut and acid etched the weld nuggets so we can really show the difference in fusion and strength and how much we can change with those outcomes. So let's get into it. Let's say I have 3 16 carbon steel. I've got my 035 solid wire hooked up to 75% argon, 25% CO2 shielding gas. I'm set up in a short circuit and I do two welds, maybe changing travel angle between them. Now, if you look at these welds, you can see the amount of fusion we have achieved, which surprisingly might not look like there is very much fusion at all. This is because when it comes to welding in the short circuit transfer mode, this mode becomes unreliable for full fusion once you get to about eighth inch and over. And here we're using 3 16 So it's very apparent that we are not getting a massive amount of fusion on this 3 16 material. 
Even the same for this thicker 3 8 material. Not a lot of fusion into the base metal, maybe a few thousands. Doesn't look very strong, does it? So what can I do? Well, you can start by changing your transfer mode. By altering the settings in the machine, we can get a desired and sometimes undesired effect. If I wanted more fusion, I could change to a globular transfer, which does give a bit more fusion, but we also get the downside of a lot, of, a lot more spat, which means most people would avoid this for the simple fact of cleanup. So we go to the next transfer, spray transfer. With spray transfer, I can get the most amount of fusion because of the high energy current we are achieving. You can see the depth into the legs and root of this joint, but what, what's the downside? Well, spray transfer can only be done in the flat and horizontal position. It is a high heat, high deposition weld and is too fluid to be done out of position or overhead. It also needs a specific gas blend. 80% argon, 20% CO2 minimum is required for spray transfer, while the best gas blends are that 90-10 or even 95-5. Arc stability increases as argon increases. If you have the option for pulse spray, which is machine specific, you can get the benefits of spray transfer while gaining puddle control and doling down the massive amount of heat input you will also get from spray. Now, as we have discovered, the transfer mode we choose has a large impact on the weld fusion we are going to find if we look inside. What if I was using short circuit but needed to achieve more fusion somehow without changing transfer modes? What could I do? Here I have three short circuit welds. All done with the same technique and settings, the only thing changed was the welding gas. One with 75-25 argon CO2, one with 95-5 argon CO2, and one with 100% CO2. Our welding gases provide a couple of key components to our weld. One, it shields our molten weld pool from atmospheric contamination, which almost always will ruin a weld if introduced. But the gases we choose also affect the arc. Gases can increase the intensity of the heat being created. They can increase or decrease arc stability and can greatly increase the amount of fusion, smoke, and spatter you might see from someone welding. We see previously that welding with 75-25 argon CO2 provided some fusion into the base metal and was really picky at that 316 thickness. But let's take a look at CO2. Looking at the outside of this weld using CO2 might not look like the best idea. The bead appearance isn't the most appealing and the spatter and smoke might turn a few heads away. But when you look inside of the weld fusion, the results are better. CO2 offers a lot more heat within the welding arc while changing nothing else. This could be a great thing if you're welding thick materials that doesn't need to be the prettiest. And you want to be cost effective since CO2 is cheaper gas than some other blends. Now let's look at that 95.5 argon CO2. This weld looks fairly uniform and consistent, pretty crowned up on the weld base, and the toes of the weld appear cold. Now let's look inside. It is very noticeable that we did not get adequate fusion into the base metal. Argon, being non-reactive, serves mostly as a shielding gas and assists in arc stability, but does not contribute to heat input. And having a very low level of CO2, the reaction in the welding arc almost decreases the heat input versus that 75-25 minutes. This might immediately shy you away from using this gas, but if you do strictly thinner materials, a lower reacting gas might be useful for you in controlling heat input and decreasing possible burn throughs on your material. Or if you mainly use spray transfer, this gas will give you good arc characteristics and the atmosphere to achieve that higher transfer mode. And all of this is only focusing on carbon steel. In our next video, I will cover stainless steel welding gases, showing all the differences there. So please, do me a favor, make sure you hit that like button, comment what you thought of the video, and subscribe so you can catch the next ones as they come out. So in conclusion, when it comes to welding, we have a whole world of possibilities and solutions to the problems we encounter trying to build the world around us. So make sure you keep an open mind, consider all the details, keep asking questions, and don't stop learning. Thanks everybody for joining us. I'll catch you next time.